Let us pray. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your many blessings. We thank you for the beauty, peace, and safety, and prosperity of these wonderful Cayman Islands. We thank you, Lord, for this ability for us to join together as industry, private sector, government, to discuss the future of our country. As we hear from our premier today, we ask you to bless the proceedings. We ask you to bless this food to our bodies, help it to be nourishing to us, and help us to remember those who do not have a meal today. We give you thanks for all your many blessings, and we give you thanks for this beautiful day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This afternoon's luncheon would not be possible without the support of our promotional and table event spot partners whose banners are proudly displayed around the room and will be showed, shown shortly during the lunch on the two screens. I'd especially like to thank the DART organization for serving as today's VIP luncheon partner. The DART organization has contributed significantly to the success of our islands over the past decade in many ways as an investor, a developer, an employer, and a responsible corporate citizen through their various contributions to many worthwhile charities and non-governmental organizations. Mrs. Jackie Doak is responsible for business development, sales, and real estate marketing and leasing. With a focus on placemaking and a passion for design, Jackie ensures the company's business development activities are aligned with Ken Dart's vision. Jackie joined Dart in 2003 as a vice president of sales and was part of the team that conceptualized Kamana Bay. Originally trained as a lawyer, Jackie holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from the College of Holy Cross, as well as a Doctor of Law honors at the, from the University of Florida. Please welcome Jackie to deliver our um, a presentation on their behalf. Good afternoon. Protocol having been established, Will, thank you very much for that very generous introduction of our company and our commitment to the Cayman Islands. As you can see, Kabu has set the stage, so I'll start with Kabu. Kabu has put the Cayman Islands firmly on the map as a destination for world-class entertainment, bringing some of the music industry's biggest stars to our stage, attracting new visitors and generating positive publicity for the island with the internationally acclaimed Seven Mile Beach as the background. Kabu sold out in its first year. We welcomed 10,000 people through the gates each day, and over a third were from overseas, many of them first-time visitors to our island. We are truly, truly grateful to all who partnered with our teams to make the magic happen, including all the government-related departments and statutory authorities who made the day seamless and enjoyable. The reviews have been overwhelmingly positive from all those who attended and from the international media. The word I keep hearing to describe Kabu Cayman is epic. This type of publicity for Cayman, especially when endorsed by celebrities like Richard Branson, Duran Duran, Blondie, The Chainsmokers, and Zed, elevates our tourism industry in the same way that the Case Conference elevates our financial services. Whether attracting high net worth visitors or ensuring that we remain the jurisdiction of choice for offshore investment, we choose to facilitate and fund world-class events such as CASE and CABU to Cayman because they directly benefit our economy in the short term and promote growth for Cayman in the future. Our hospitality portfolio continues to be a focus in 2019, and we recognize the value of successful hotels to the local economy. Hotels generate direct benefits such as job and government revenue, and they contribute to the annual GDP of the company. I did say job, but I should say jobs because they bring a lot of jobs to the country. We are delighted to announce today that we're in the process of finalizing the acquisition of Le Soleil d'Or, a boutique hotel on Cayman Brac. When it launched in 2014, Le Soleil d'Or established itself as a luxury resort known for its farm-to-table restaurant using produce from its garden. However, since 2017, the hotel has been virtually closed to guests with only one of its nine villas opened. Le Soleil d'Or will provide us with an intriguing opportunity to offer multiple destination vac vacations within the Cayman Islands, complementing our existing portfolio of hotels in Grand Cayman and Cayman Brac. Our intention is to restore the resort to full operation, retaining all current members of staff. We also wanted to let you know that the Beach Suites recently reopened as an independent boutique hotel. 
As the property owner, we conducted renovations on behalf of the new operators. We upgraded all the guest rooms and cha made changes to the pool area and the restaurant. The hotel had a soft opening last month before filling all of its rooms with guests for Cabo. And as our tourism numbers continue to rise, so does the daily demand on Seven Mile Beach. So it's very important that we strike a balance between the expectations of stayover visitors and our cruise passengers. And that is why there is a need to accommodate the current volume and the anticipated growth in the number of stayover and cruise tourism visitors. And this has led us to explore opportunities up in Barkers. Switching now to our real estate portfolio. Since we gathered here last year, we have launched our first for sale residential at Kamana Bay, Olea, in partnership with NCB. Sales are going strong with 50% of phase one and phase two reserved since our launch last year. Site works have already begun and we will have an official groundbreaking in April. Phase one is expected to be completed in August of 2020 and phase two in February of 2021. Two more phases will be released in due course. In the meantime, we are full steam ahead with two other major projects at Kamana Bay. The new early childhood center at the Cayman International School is on track to open in August, adding 164 new spaces to our primary school system. CIS is the cornerstone of our community and also has an important role to play in the future growth of Kamana Bay by providing access to best-in-class education. We are also building a new high school facility, which not only expands the physical space, but it also expands the educational and extracurricular programs CIS can offer. The new high school facilities will open in time for the 2020 school year. And as our, our community continues to grow, we will soon be able to offer people who live, work, and visit Kamana Bay the convenience of Cayman's largest supermarket when the new Foster's Food Fair opens in November. Woody, that's a few months, are you ready? Yep. Great. The demand for Class A commercial office space continues to be strong. Our leasing, leasing team's focus is on attracting new business from overseas, promoting the ease of doing business and the ease of relocating to the Cayman Islands. And we are now in the early design stages of our next office building. And finally, our continued commitment and investment in Cayman informs our approach to our community development programs. If for 2019, we are focused on three core areas, education, youth development, and the physical environment. To complement this, we have launched DART Grants, a new program that encourages nonprofit organizations operating in Cayman to apply for one of 15 grants set at $10,000, $25,000, or $50,000. The goal is to facilitate local organizations to make a positive impact at a larger scale. Together, we can build a stronger community. We know there is value in working together to accomplish our goals, whether it's CABU, CASE, public-private partnerships, grants to nonprofit organizations, or sponsorships of this Chamber of Commerce luncheon. As Simon Sinek says, together is better, and collaboration makes us all more powerful in achieving our shared objective of a stable, prosperous, and innovative Cayman. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, members and special guests. Um, let me begin by welcoming His Excellency the Governor, Martin Roper, and UCCI President Stacy McAfee to their first legislative luncheon. The Chamber and I look forward to working with you to establish a productive working relationship and continuing our conversations so that we can make sure that we've addressed all of the main concerns for all of our members. The membership of the Chamber of Commerce represents all sectors of the Cayman Islands economy, from sole proprietors to large multinational corporations, and the elected council works diligently to interact with members to determine their concerns. As I'm sure you're all aware, Last December, we invited members to complete a survey on the state of the business um, for, what, for 2018 and what they foresee going into 2019. All of the key business uh, issues and the community issues that they want to address for the council for the coming year, 
and I'm pleased today to share with you some of those results for the first time. Owners and senior managers from 160 member businesses responded to the survey, with more than half being from micro and small businesses. These survey results represent virtually all of the industry sectors and in general had a very positive outlook. Key findings from the survey indicated that two-thirds of the respondents have seen an increase in revenue over the past year, and another 20% reported revenues at least equal to the year before. More than half of those that responded to the survey indicated an increase in profits, and nearly 70% plan to hire additional staff this year. Just under 20% on top of that are also looking for new additional office space. While these all sound great, we must also report that over 65% of the businesses that responded saw an increase in their expenses. Just under 20% of these businesses plan to outsource some of their work to on-island providers, and a similar number have already planned to outsource some of these to other jurisdictions. Outside of the survey, I have spoken to several members and found that the cost of living is amongst the biggest concerns for business owners and management. The rapidly increasing cost of housing and a lack of affordable housing developments in the pipeline are all a major concern and one that may be one of the, most, uh, one of the largest threats to, to sustained growth in our economy. A population of 100,000 is a target that we often hear. Now, I have four children, and if everybody here tries to keep on pace with me, we might just get there the old-fashioned way. <laughs> but I think we can assume that most of this growth is going to come from attracting new industries, new companies, and new workers from outside of the Cayman Islands. Without the availability, of affo of afford uh, without the availability and affordability of housing for a growing workforce, we're going to find ourselves in a very challenging situation. I would encourage the government to think of ways to encourage and incentivize developers to target these types of investments. In the survey, members were also asked to identify three key business issues that they want the council to advocate for in 2019. The top five categories listed in order of priority are one, government efficiency and regulation, two, access to skilled labor, work permit process, and education, three, business costs, four, infrastructure and business development, and five, safety and security. With the majority of members indicating that the government, government efficiency and regulation is their number one and most important issue, I'd like to take a, a moment firstly to thank you and to congratulate the current government on the prog progress that has already been made. The survey also asked our members to for their experience in using key government departments and authorities. Any of those that have embraced online services and payment processes to reduce the level of bureaucracy and therefore improve customer experience have, ex have received extremely positive remarks. I cannot emphasize strongly enough how important these types of improvements are and how much of an impact streamlining these government functions have been not only to the business community, but to everyday life and the community as a whole. Turning to the community, members identified the following five categories as their top priority for us to advocate for. Number one, infrastructure improvement. Number two, community development and cost of living. Three, safety and security. Four, education and skills development. And five, environmental concerns and littering. The findings of the State of Business Survey reinforce what is already widely known. The Cayman Islands economy is performing well, with many businesses experiencing growth and profitability. That's great news, and we need to continue to work diligently to continue this trend, which creates jobs provides, and provides the revenue we need to, in, to fund important infrastructure projects and social and community programs. Key projects such as the new airport, the new roundabout near the cricket pitch, the new Public Works Department headquarters and the new hospice care facility are important investments for our future and will help to improve the delivery of public services. Other projects that need to be considered in the upcoming budget include the completion of the John Gray High School, addressing the, the traffic bottleneck at the Grand Harbor Roundabout, 
and as mentioned, additional affordable, affordable housing projects throughout the, Grand, throughout the Cayman Islands, but especially in Grand Cayman. The proposed cruise berthing facility and cargo expansion project is also important for Cayman's ongoing development, and the Chamber looks forward to receiving further information when it becomes available, possibly even today, as we heard on some Facebook announcements last night. Looking forward, the Ministry, Ministry of Planning's Plan Cayman initiative is essential to our future development as our Cayman Islands economy grows and places new development pressures on Grand Cayman's landmass and environment. The Council established a committee chaired by Councillor Simon Watson, which includes representatives from the Cayman Contractors Association, Cayman Islands Real Estate Brokers Association, Cayman Architects, Surveyors and Engineers, and the Royal Institute of Chartered, Surve Chartered Surveyors to provide constructive feedback. The Council and I encourage all members to engage in this important public consultation, since this will set such a, an important foundation for our future development in each of the districts. If you haven't done so already, please visit plankman.ky for more information and take the online survey, which makes it very easy for you and convenient to submit your feedback. The Chamber commends government on its decision to establish the Ministry of International Trade, Investment, Aviation, and Maritime Affairs. Enhancing Cayman's international image in areas like financial services, aviation, and maritime agencies will produce a unified platform and will enable Cayman to attract new businesses to our shores and promote the island's reputation. While we have not discovered the full details of this uh, mission of this new ministry, the Chamber feels it will bring a fantastic opportunity to explore the creation of an investment development agency. The most successful inward investment agencies around the world are independent, driven, and guided by proactive private sector, and works with government to develop the policies and plans to attract, inward, uh, to attract investment. We encourage our, our government to take a similar approach. The Chamber is prepared to work with the Premier and the new Chief Officer, Eric Bush, to assist with the creation of strategic plans and policies in global commu communication and international trade and investment. Most of our largest competitors have such agencies already in full force. A few examples are Halifax, Jersey, and Bermuda, all of which have dedicated teams of anywhere from 15 to 50 employees whose sole mission is to encourage investment in these jurisdictions. Each of these development ag agencies have private and public funding, but operate outside of a typical government structure to allow them to work independently and attract top, trop, attract top talent to drive investment in all of their industry sectors. The Council feels that this opportunity is so important that we are willing to either commit and or ra help raise funds toward a consultant to guide the creation of such an agency. We have members ready to pledge time and work with government to ensure that it is built on the right foundation. Trying to take advantage of a fantastic turnout today, I'd like to take a shameless plug for the next important Chamber event. On May 23rd, the Chamber, in partnership with the Ministry of Finance, Economic Development, and Economic Development, will be hosting the second annual Economic Forum. Minister McTaggart will provide an update on the state of government finances and any key messages that the Cabinet wishes to relay at that time. Since there are several issues to address, we plan to expand the forum to a full day event so that we have more time to delve into these issues. We'll work with the industry associations to develop the agenda and identify the key topics that require further discussion and debate. In closing, I would like to thank the Premier and other representatives of government for attending this luncheon today. It is through close collaboration between government and the private sector that we've been able to accomplish such great things. It all, is also only through that collaboration that we will continue to succeed. I'd also like to thank our, you, our members, for supporting this event and making it possible today. I'm pleased to report that this is the largest turnout for any legislative, uh, legislative luncheon since we introduced the event several years ago. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. The Premier of the Cayman Islands, the Honorable Alden McLaughlin, was the first elected to the Legislative Assembly in 2000 and has been a legislator ever since. 
He served as the Minister of Education, Training, Employment, Youth, Sports, and Culture from 2005 to 2009. For his contribution to constitutional development in the Cayman Islands, Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II awarded him the MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honors in 2010. In February 2011, he became political leader of the Progressives, of which he is a founding member. He was subsequently sworn in as leader of the opposition legislative assembly in the Cayman Islands. He was named premier following the general elections of the Cayman Islands in May 2013, where the progressives won the majority of seats. He served as Minister for Home Affairs, Health, and Culture from 2013 to 2017. He is the first premier to serve consecutive terms in the Cayman Islands with his re-election in May 2017. He also serves as Minister for Human Resources, Immigration, and Community Affairs. We are honored to welcome the Honorable Premier, Alvin McLaughlin. Good afternoon, everyone. I too will dispense with protocol. Chris, I've, I don't know what to say actually because there have been many times when I've come to address the Chamber of Commerce annual luncheon when I've had to put on my gospel armor before I got here. <laughs> Sometimes I felt I needed a bulletproof vest. <laughs> but uh, your speech tended to indicate that generally speaking, what we are doing has the Chamber's endorsement, and for that, I am very thankful. Thank you and, and your team for inviting us again, and especially for allowing me to address this August Assembly. Last year, I highlighted the improving relationship between government and the business community and the importance of continuing to develop that relationship. That spirit of partnership has continued to grow, and there are many examples of how our joint leadership has served to advance the interests of these islands. I will highlight these as I speak, but I thank past president Paul Biles, the chamber council, member businesses, and Will and his team for their important contributions. The coming year will be very good, for islands. The royal visit of Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall in March will certainly be a highlight in a year that I expect will have many such, but none more important. And so government intends to make the 28th of March, 2018, Thursday, a public holiday in honor of this royal visit. If you were present last year, <clears throat> you may recall that I began with a video in which leading regional economist Marla Dukaran described the Cayman Islands as the best-run economy in the whole Caribbean. The performance of Cayman's economy over the last year consolidates our position at the top of Ms. Dukaran's league table. Government continues to run excellent surpluses with preliminary 2018 results indicating revenues of 832.3 million with a surplus of 178 million, some 91.4 million more than budgeted. We continue to pay down debt and to operate from cash. GDP growth was 3.7% in the first six months of last year, and the official forecast for the 2018 year end is 3.4%. The economy continues to perform strongly, and as we anticipated, our economic success continues to generate jobs and opportunities for Caymanians. The 2018 Spring Labor Force Survey showed an overall increase in employment, with Caymanians in work increasing by 3.4%, while employment among non-Caymanians declined by 4.1%. Correspondingly, unemployment decreased to 3.4% from 4.1% in the same period of 2017. Unemployment was lower across all status groups, but the highest reduction was among Caymanians, which fell from 7.3% in the first half of 2017 to 5.3% in the same period in 2018. And when the fall 2018 labor force survey is completed and released, it will show yet further improvement. Preliminary results indicate that in fall 2018, 
when compared with fall 2017, total unemployment would have dropped to 2.9% from 4.9%, and Caymanian unemployment has dropped to 4.6% from 7.3% in 2017. This is the lowest level of Caymanian unemployment in more than a decade. Last year, I appealed to businesses here to redouble efforts to employ suitably qualified and experienced Caymanians. These figures represent a significant achievement, and I am truly grateful to all contributing employers, and in particular, those of you in the Chamber of Commerce. I am far from complacent, though, and acknowledge there is much more we must do to strengthen the position of Caymanians in the job market. I will talk about the action we are taking in that regard shortly, but for now, I will simply reflect that the figures I just gave represent a significant step towards fulfillment of this government's key pledge to keep full Caymanian employment. A strong economy where every Caymanian who is willing and able to work can find a suitable job. I will take a, a risk now and read you a, a message I received just a short while ago from one of my most vocal critics on various talk shows and elsewhere. <laughs> I'm not one that likes to call names, so I won't do that. But his first name begins with Stanley <laughs> and ends with Hill. Good morning, Mr. Premier. One thing I can give kudos to you for, you sure fulfill your promises of everyone having a job. Things are finally looking good for me. Thanks. Now, this is a government I can relate to. You must be taking some pages from Trump. <laughs> Laugh out loud. <laughs> the other key macroeconomic indicator, inflation, is one we are watching closely. The latest data for the Consumer Price Index give an annualized inflation figure of 3.5% for the third quarter of last year. While high by recent standards, the figure has dropped back from a peak of 4.8% in the previous quarter. Economists among you may point out that such is the nature of price variations over time, and that these recent figures come on the back of a period of deflation, falling prices, in the Cayman Islands. And so, taking a longer-term view, prices in the Cayman economy in September 2018 were actually only 2.5% higher overall than they had been in September 2014. That represents a significant five-year period of overall low inflation. However, we recognize that the current level of inflation can represent a squeeze on living standards and the cost of doing business. But the tools available to government to reduce inflation are limited. As an example, one of the most significant re recent price increases was a jump in electricity prices. But remember, this government has maintained the significant fuel duty reductions brought in by my last administration that are still helping keep utility costs down. We also continued reductions on various import duties to licensed retailers to help lower prices. And we increased the duty-free allowance at the airport from $350 to $500 per person for goods purchased abroad. We will continue to do what we can to maintain living standards, especially for the vulnerable. Last month saw the second of our promised increases in the minimum income we guarantee to those in receipt of social assistance, retired seamen and veterans, and retired long-serving civil servants. These individuals saw their monthly receipts from government rising to $750. That increase of at least 36% since, since this government took office under two years ago is directly benefiting hundreds of Caymanians, and I should add, delivering on another of the key pledges we made to the country. Lest we forget, though, the best way to ensure a good standard of living is to ensure we deliver economic growth so our people can access well-paid jobs. 
Indeed, the best social program is a good job. The picture of success I am able to paint this afternoon owes much to the continued strong performance of Cayman's two pillar industries, financial services and tourism. Cayman's financial services industry continues to thrive even as it constantly adapts to changing global circumstances. The ability of the industry to innovate and the willingness of government to combine a business-friendly environment with appropriate but proportionate regulation will continue to maintain our competitive advantage. But we must recognize that there are major global players determined to undermine Cayman's success. Our position is straightforward. Where there are reasonable demands to raise global regulatory standards, we will comply. So long as there remains a level playing field. Our willingness to do so is evident by the economic substance legislation we passed in the Legislative Assembly just before Christmas. This is one of those areas where I must thank the representatives of more than 15 financial services and commerce associations that supported the Minister for Financial Services, her team, and the government to tailor that legislation to meet the requirements of those who set global regulation standards as well as our own local business community. I remain confident that if the EU listing process is fair, we will not end up on any blacklist, but we take nothing for granted and continue our engagement with the EU Commission and member states. Looking ahead, the future of Cayman's financial services industry will face more challenges, not just from the EU and the OECD, but also from the FATF. I am confident that we can manage those challenges and working together, government and the industry can keep pace with changing global standards while preserving the special characteristics of this jurisdiction that make it an attractive place to do business. Given the challenges our financial services the industry is constantly facing, it is even more critical that we do all we can to secure the future of our other key economic pillar, tourism, and seek to accelerate economic diversification to reduce our reliance on both those industries. For that reason, the current controversy over the cruise piers is not something that can be seen in isolation. Cayman's tourism sector is flourishing. Last year, we received nearly 2.4 million visitors, the highest number in our history. The number of stayover visitors broke previous records, and cruise visitor numbers would have also seen a record year, but for bad weather in December that prevented 12 ships from stopping here. This success is the result of a lot of hard work. The Minister for Tourism and his team have a marketing approach that is the envy of the region. In the end, though, it is the quality of the offer that drives our success. Yes, we have many natural advantages, but it is the continual improvement in the standards of our hotels, restaurants, and associated businesses, coupled with our infrastructure, as well as our people, that keeps bringing visitors to our shores. Some of our critics, critics of the government, I mean, point to our success and ask why we need to change. Surely, if Cayman continues to attract visitors, why do we need a new port? Even our fiercest critics accept, though, that the cruise industry is changing. They accept the trend towards bigger ships, but seem to believe the changes can leave Cayman unaffected. They argue that these bigger ships will only gradually come into service and that they can continue to tender their passengers ashore in Grand Cayman. I liken this approach to that of the Kodak Company, which enjoyed decades of growth and became a cultural point of reference the world over. Its Kodak moment tagline became part of everyday speech. I'm sure that there were those sitting at the company headquarters during the 1990s saying, we are continuing to grow. Why do we need to change? Kodak did not fail because it did not see digital photography coming. Indeed, Kodak invented the world's first digital camera in 1975. Rather, 
it failed to understand the profound impact that change would have on its business, not overnight, but over time. After a period of decline that lasted some 20 years, Kodak filed for bankruptcy protection in 2012. The company survives, but is unrecognizable from the 20th century giant it had been. I fear that will be the outcome for our cruise industry if we refuse to pay attention to the way the market is developing. We will go into a gradual but sure decline, and our cruise sector will eventually be diminished. This government will not allow that to happen. It was at a chamber luncheon in 2015 that I announced that after careful consideration, government had agreed on the merits of building a cruise port and enhanced cargo port. We not only remain committed to the cruise dock and cargo port project, but are even surer of the merits today. The new cruise dock is vital to safeguard the future of Cayman's tourism industry, whilst the new cargo facilities will receive larger cargo ships and help support the island's growing population, and by allowing greater economies of scale, help to mitigate some of the cost pressures impacting our cost of living. Whilst we are committed to delivering the port project, cruise and cargo, and to securing the growth and jobs they will bring, we are not doing so recklessly and without regard to the costs. I have previously made two promises to the country, which I will repeat here. First, we will structure the financing of the port project in such a way as to not expose the country's finances to disproportionate risk. Secondly, we will minimize or mitigate the environmental impact of the project. We have already delivered on the first of those promises. We announced last December that we have concluded agreements with Carnival and Royal Caribbean, the two largest cruise companies, on their financial commitment towards the cost of constructing the new piers. I am happy to announce today that Disney has also given its commitment towards the financing of the port project. These agreements, coupled with the finance to be provided by the preferred bidder on the project, effectively ensure that no public money will be required to build a new cruise berths and enhanced cargo facility. When I addressed you in 2015, I stated that the cruise companies must have skin in the game to ensure that we receive the necessary volume of cruise passengers over the period required for the financing to be repaid. That promise is being kept. And I want to assure the leader of the opposition that no current fees paid by the cruise companies to government will be used to repay the financing package. Having delivered on that first promise, we will now ensure that the second promise is kept as well. I have said before that I respect the views of those who argue that no economic benefit can outweigh environmental concerns. But while I respect their viewpoint, this is not a position that a responsible government can take. In my view, this comes down to a question of judgment. Do the benefits outweigh the costs? In my judgment and that of my government, $245 million of net economic benefit, hundreds of construction jobs, and then decades of increasing employment and business opportunities for Caymanians in the tourism industry definitely outweigh the inevitable environmental costs in a part of Grand Cayman's only working harbor. What we can and will do is ensure that the final design of the new piers will avoid as much environmental impact as possible. Where we cannot avoid it, we will aim to mitigate the effects. The project is now in its sixth year, and we continue to move forward carefully and deliberately. The procurement process is winding down, and a preferred bidder will be chosen by this summer. Once this is done, we will be in a position to speak more to the final design and projected costs. So we will continue to support tourism, as well as our financial services industry, despite the challenges. But we will also continue to support increased diversification of our economy. I was delighted, therefore, to attend the groundbreaking ceremony on the first phase of the new campus development at Cayman Enterprise City late last year as well as welcome the launch of the new Tech Cayman Initiative. Both add further strength to this country's offer to attract knowledge-based industries 
and other entrepreneurs, and both have the support of government. I would add that Health City Cayman Islands continues to prove its increasing social and economic value, especially for health tourism. Recently in New York, I addressed a reinsurance roundtable event where reinsurance businesses spoke in glowing terms of the value of locating in the Cayman Islands. These are market segments that are both ripe for growth and government will do what we can to attract and support reinsurance and health tourism companies. The brilliantly organized and hugely successful Kabu Music Festival last weekend is also a good indication of the potential value of large-scale festivals and conferences to these islands. Our development sector continues to help power the Cayman economic engine, and the addition of new hotels to our tourism product will help stimulate as well as support more growth for years to come. There is simply no other way to put it. Cayman is doing very well. However, our future success is not guaranteed. And in an increasingly competitive global economy, this jurisdiction needs to be ready to compete in good times or in bad. That competition is not just about attracting business to Cayman. It is also about making sure that entrepreneurial Caymanians are able to take the opportunities that future growth of our economy will bring. The Minister for Commerce has been pursuing a two-pronged strategy to support small business development. In the first strategy, Trade and business license requirements have been streamlined, and the whole renewal process has been moved online. Indeed, we are making good progress across a range of e-government services. The second strategy is about improving the support available to small and micro businesses. Just last week, the Minister and the Cayman Islands Small Business Association signed a memorandum of understanding aimed at delivering services, including workshops mentoring sessions, grants, and individual assistance to small business. The partnership between public and private sectors will be further enhanced through the establishment of a small business center. This government has also maintained the greatly reduced fees for small businesses put in place by the last administration, and in 2018, some 4,800 micro or small businesses benefited from these reduced fees. For Caymanians not inclined to open a business, a high-quality education is a crucial gateway to future employment. And so I'm grateful to those in this room and beyond who support the work being spearheaded by the Education Minister. Amongst other, amongst other measures, the Minister and the Chairman of the Education Council, Mr. Dan Scott, recently returned from a fact-finding tour in the UK, looking at how we can learn from their experience, including through an upgraded and modernized curriculum as a key tool in helping to raise standards in Cayman's public schools. Also critical is our ongoing investment enhancing, in enhancing our school infrastructure, both at primary and secondary levels. And we continue to encourage and support as best we can private schools to enhance their facilities as well. Of course, as important as curriculum and school buildings are, Attracting and keeping good teachers is especially key. And so we have ensured that the remuneration of our teachers is being increased. I've spoken before about the various vocational studies initiatives, including the very successful City and Guilds Vocational Studies Program run by the Public Works Department. This has grown over the past few years and today provides a variety of training courses to some 17 Caymanian apprentices. Our plans are to expand this to serve at least 50 students during this year with training provided in a number of fields, including air conditioning, plumbing, electrical, and carpentry. The improvements in education will help future generations, but we also need to further improve the position of Caymanians in the job market now. As I indicated earlier, unemployment among Caymanians has fallen significantly. But now is the time to put in place improvements that will maintain that position as we go forward. That task will be spearheaded by the new Workforce Opportunities and Residency Cayman, or WORK, department. WORK officially went live this month, and implementation of the changes will follow in the next few months. 
The first of those will be the online jobs clearinghouse, due to go live around Easter, through which all jobs in the Cayman Islands will be advertised, allowing Caymanians full access to the opportunities available. Improvements that the government has promised in the work permit regime are also progressing. I wish to acknowledge the Chamber's assistance in helping develop a new simplified and modern work permit system. We have more to do to road test the proposed changes and we have undertaken to work with business as we do so. As a country, we need to embrace the opportunities of growth, but it is time that we do so in a planned and measured way. For that reason, we are consulting the public on a new national planning framework for the Cayman Islands, known as Plan Cayman. This encompasses several things to which the government is already committed. For example, it recognizes the work we have been doing to modernize the country's infrastructure. The framework incorporates the much needed revitalization of Georgetown and also reflects the ambitions in our national energy policy. It also seeks the views of the public on new ideas and approaches to how we develop and ensure our future is sustainable. I hope the framework will ignite a national debate about our future. To that end, I would like to thank the Chamber for hosting an event on the framework last December. We have extended the consultation deadline until the end of this month to give everyone as much chance as possible to contribute their ideas, and I would encourage everyone in the business community to take part. We are, of course, continuing to invest in the infrastructure this country needs for its future. We are picking up the pace on Georgetown revitalization, and I would like to say how welcome it is to see the appointment of Mr. Colin Lumsden as the country's first town manager to take that work forward. Having put in place some of the necessary infrastructure improvements, the time has now come to reimagine what our capital might be like in the future. The government wants the exercise of planning and delivering that future to be fully inclusive, to be a fully inclusive process. For that reason, we will put in place a steering committee of stakeholders to guide the project. I hope the Chamber will accept our invitation to be represented on the committee. We want the committee to involve the wider community, and so we are planning a town hall charrette to engage everyone in the future design of our capital and its town center. To those who will be involved in the work as the, work, as the project progresses, I want to encourage you to be bold. This is an opportunity to think more radically about what might be possible in terms of how we utilize the space and the activities we want to see in the capital. The government has previously removed some of the restrictions that prevented sensible development. So I want the committee to explore the freedom we will give them to develop exciting plans for innovative mixed-use development in Georgetown, including considering sensible building heights as necessary to encourage investors to redevelop and breathe new life into our capital. We also continue to invest in much needed road infrastructure. This year, we will progress the second phase of the Linford Pearson expansion project that will give four lanes between the Agnes Way roundabout and the Bobby Thompson Smith Road traffic lights. Nearing completion is the connector road, a new roundabout joining Printer's Way to Crew Road in the proximity of the Mango Tree Restaurant and Bar. In the next few months, the Olympic Way Walker's Road connector will be constructed to help reduce congestion on Walker's Road and more effectively segregate school traffic. Later this year, work is due to start on the extension of Godfrey Nixon Way from the Blue Marlin Restaurant on Eastern Avenue to the Fish Shack on North Church Street, creating an important link for crews and port traffic. Looking a bit further ahead, Design work is underway for the expansion of Shamrock Road and Hurley Merrin Boulevard from four to six lanes. This will ease congestion that motorists moving east or coming from the east encounter. This work will commence later this year. We're also looking at how best to move forward later this year with the much needed continuation of the east-west arterial road through to Frank Sound with phase one connecting Hirsch Road to northward. 
Meanwhile, work will be completed at the airport and it will be opened at the end of next month by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. This will be a proud moment for all of us who call these islands home. Much has been said about the delay and added cost of the airport expansion. I will say this, when the airport expansion was designed some years back, we considered what we thought was affordable at the time. Government was unable to borrow any money in those days. As our finances improved, we looked again at what was needed to make a very good airport experience even better. And so broadly, half of the additional spend was the result of positive decisions to improve the quality of the redeveloped airport for the benefit of travelers. I and my government are satisfied that the decisions taken in this regard were sensible and affordable, and I'm satisfied that the public will also agree once the expansion is complete and the airport is fully operational. As we think about the future of our islands, we must also consider Cayman's place in a changing world. To that end, I announced last year this government's intention to create a new Ministry of International Trade, Investment, Aviation and Maritime Affairs. The new ministry has now been established with me as minister and will focus on advancing the economic and political interests of the country, the Caymanian people and the business community and will make it easier for potential overseas investors to do business in the Cayman Islands. This includes business that may flow to Cayman as we seek opportunities to participate in the UK's Global Britain Initiative post-Brexit. The new minister will take direct responsibility for the Cayman Islands Government Office in London and a limited range of existing government departments and entities, including the shipping and aviation registers. Over time, the minister will develop a select ne network of international offices to better achieve its, status, its stated purpose. Plans are already underway for the establishment of an Asia office in Hong Kong. I must thank those business leaders, led by past president Biles, who gave their time to the development of that business case. An office in Washington is also being considered for 2020, as is one in Brussels, if it is thought useful after the UK leaves the European Union. In setting up both a new ministry and an Asia office, the case for change is underpinned by the view that international issues will become increasingly important to the well-being of these islands. The government accepts that there are costs and indeed potential risks in this approach. However, having done the business case, we believe the benefits are significant enough to justify the investment we are making. This same analysis will be done prior to any new international offices being established. Being established. I have concentrated today on government's economic record and our view of the future of our economy. But before I sit down, there are a few other matters I thought would be helpful for chamber members to hear about. Firstly, whilst I'm confident that our economy will remain very strong over the next 12 to 18 months, the picture is less clear after that. Indications are that growth in major economies will slow over the next year. I believe that the momentum we, have, we now have, coupled with sound finances, place us in a good position to manage any such slowdown. But the Minister for Finance and the entire government are paying close attention and bearing this in mind as we start planning for the next budget cycle. The latest constitution talks were held in London in December. Our requests have been generally well received and I'm encouraged by the willingness of the UK to respond positively to what I believe to be a sensible and pragmatic set of proposals. Clearly, we will not get everything we want, but the negotiations are proceeding well, and I hope they will be brought to a positive conclusion in the coming months, hopefully in time for our constitutional celebrations that kick off in July, another key event in this year's calendar to celebrate Cayman. I also wish to acknowledge the Governor, Mr. Martin Roper, for working in such a spirit of partnership since his arrival, including assisting with and supporting the establishment of the new ministry. The Governor and I are also working together with the Commissioner of Police to ensure the country's safety and security 
and we share an ambition to reduce crime and criminality and improve the security of our borders. This month saw the launch of the Cayman Islands Customs and Border Control Service, but already the new intelligence-led approach of the service is bearing fruit. One good example is that at the same time that we launched the green customs channel at the airport and higher personal import duty limits, both customs revenues and successful interdictions by border control officers are up. Further innovations will follow during this year. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Border Control Service began a procurement process to introduce new immigration and passport control kiosks, very much like the ones you will have used at various international airports. We expect a pilot utilizing four such kiosks to be in place by the end of this year. Also this year, we will introduce a fully online visa application process. Another important step is the creation of the new Coast Guard Service. As well as being part of that border security network, the Coast Guard has other vital functions relating to safety at sea, including maritime search and rescue. The next significant development for the service will see the opening in the coming weeks of the new Operations and Rescue Coordination Center, which will play a key role in ensuring Cayman can coordinate search and rescue and other activities on a 24-7, 365-day basis. The approach the government is taking can also be seen at the community level, including the drive to reinvigorate neighborhood policing, alongside things like the creation of a new neighborhood watch schemes, something the government has been very keen to see. This more accessible, visible, and responsive policing is having a direct and positive impact on the lives of Caymanians, visitors, and businesses. Delivering that kind of direct impact on the lives of Caymanians is central to what this government has set out to do, and it is not just in the area of crime reduction that our success is being felt. We have responded to concerns that Caymanians are being priced out of the housing market by pushing forward the National Housing Development Trust Affordable Housing Program. Last month, ground was broken on a scheme in East End that followed the successful completion of 16 new homes in Bodentown last year. As the six East End homes are finished, work will begin on eight more homes in West Bay. The Trust is also buying 10 acres on which to build in Northside and recently bought a 24-acre plot of land in Georgetown. I thank the Trust and the Minister for Housing for their tireless efforts. The government has also significantly increased the stamp duty thresholds for first-time Caymanian home buyers, allowing greater numbers of Caymanians to purchase first-time properties without having to pay stamp duty or to pay it at discounted rates. This represents a welcome leg up onto the property ladder for many young Caymanians and their families. Elsewhere, the government has continued its work to create a healthier environment and to preserve more public land, particularly beaches, for the enjoyment of our people and visitors. We have procured 634 acres of protected land, increasing the total amount to 4,111 acres, about 6.3% of Cayman's total land mass. This year, we will continue the policy of acquiring land for public use, including beach land and land for parks. The East End Housing Scheme will also create a new recreation park in the district. We have purchased a property used by the Scranton community for many years as a park. This purchase safeguards public asset access to that important community space in perpetuity. Government is working directly with the central Stranton community on plans to improve the property. Land has also been acquired to create a park that will serve the Red Bay and Prospect constituencies. Those communities will also help guide the development and public use of that park. Work will commence this year on this Smith Bacadere addition once planning and design are completed. And the South Sound Boardwalk and the South Sound Boardwalk has been completed and provides a safe walking zone as well as preserves beautiful vistas of the sea for the enjoyment of all. Work continues on the integrated solid waste management project, and after more than five years of work and negotiations, 
we are nearing agreement with the preferred bidder, DECO. The project addresses the solid waste management needs for these islands for the next 25 years. This is a design, build, finance, and operate public-private partnership that will not require any capital investment by the government. This is a key deliverable of my government, and we are very pleased to have made it to this juncture. Much is being achieved by this government, and it is all being done in a fiscally responsible way. We continue to operate with surpluses even higher than those that we budgeted to achieve. Our capital investments are being paid for from cash without increased borrowing, and we continue to repay government debt. We have not increased fees or taxes since I was sworn in as Premier in May of 2013. This government's track, track record of delivery and sound stewardship of the finances is the result of the very hard work done by my ministers and councillors, as well as the long-suffering civil service. I thank them for the support they give me and for the work they do every day for the people we serve. I want to pay a special tribute to the Deputy Governor and the Attorney General and the Cabinet Secretary for the incredible work and the support that we receive on a weekly basis. Ours is indeed a unity government, one where we may take different views, but where we are at all willing to work together towards our shared ambitions for these Cayman Islands. I also have to pay tribute to the Speaker, the Honorable McKeever Bush, for his continued support of the coalition government. We have achieved much together, but our ambitions are not yet fulfilled. We have a lot left to achieve and just over two years in which to do it. But with the same determination and pragmatism demonstrated in our first two years, I have no doubt we will achieve what we set out to do. The best, the best for Cayman is yet to come. Well, thank you very much, Premier. That was an amazing address. Um, a lot of information that you shared with us. A lot of the questions on my list here have been answered, which is a good thing. But I, I just kind of want to have a, a brief conversation. We've never done it this format at the legislative luncheon. I thought it would be good just to have a, a conversation with you. Um, and, and I think I'll start the conversation. You know, being premier of a country is a, a, a massive responsibility. So kind of want to get a personal reflection from you. I mean, what really keeps you up at night? What are some of the things that really concern you and also what you're most proud of in what you see in the Cayman Islands today? I suppose what keeps me up most these days is thinking about um, succession planning and who is going to follow me uh, because I have two years and three months left in this role. So that's sort of my number one um, concern because planning and, and proper succession planning is critical to the success of any, any organization, any entity, and government is no different. And maybe what do you think one of um, your biggest achievements? Uh, you've been holding a premier for a number of years now. Uh, what makes you most proud of the government that you represent? Well, this is my, my second term as premier, as everyone knows. Coming up now in six years since I've been premier, I think what I've been most, most proud of is that in the first term, we, we didn't win. We won a majority, but not an outright majority. Uh, and we put together a government which delivered quite well uh, for Cayman over the course of those four years. In the last election, we wound up with only seven progressive members of the 19 seats. And I've had to put together a coalition government. Being able to not just hold that coalition government together, but for it to be able to work in, in such um, in, in such a cooperative and um, progressive way, progressive with a small p, in a pro progressive way has, has been, I think, um, well beyond my, my greatest expectations. When, when I realized that we actually did have a government together, I went home and spent that whole night awake saying, boy, what have you done? 
<laughs> you will die of, of, of high blood pressure or a heart attack over the course of the next four years, trying to keep this disparate group of, of people moving forward in a, in a, in a coordinated and, and, and way and, and doing productive work. But it hasn't been like that at all. It, I have an incredible team of, of people. The caucus works so well together that um, it's, been, it's been an amazing experience. I hope as we say in Cayman, and I put my goat mud on it now, <laughs> but because uh, we still have two years and three months to go, but it, it really, I think it is the teamwork that we have uh, and, and the shared vision. And I don't mean that, that there's one person, even me, that comes in with a vision and everybody just shares it. I mean our ability to develop a shared vision for where we are trying to take the country, dealing with the, with the, the, with the vast array of challenges that, that we have. I think that is, that is the thing I am most proud of. And over the last few years, I think, you know, the Caymanian people have always been ones that are very loyal to the United Kingdom, very supportive. You've just announced that we have another royal visit coming, which is an incredible achievement. But again, what we have is a situation where increasingly the United Kingdom has put forward issues and policies and discussions which are really irritating the Caymanian people. Um, now we're just recently with the Foreign Affairs Committee, they've just recently put some things forward. I mean, I know it's just uh, circulating in our community now, but what is your reaction as Premier when you go and you shake hands with the UK officials and trying to forge a real lasting partnership when you see things like this coming across, which really could change the way of life for the Caymanian people? I'm irritated too. <laughs> But uh, I think I think there there needs to be um, we have to put these things in in perspective and in context. Those of us, which I believe is just about everybody who watch television on a regular basis or listen to the news or or, or read it on online, will realize the, the level of dysfunction that is currently operating within the British electoral system and particularly within Parliament. And they have their share of challenges as well. Just holding the government together in the UK is now a, is a ma massive challenge. So the Foreign Affairs Committee is not a government committee. It is a committee of the parliament. Its views do not necessarily represent the views of the current UK government. They have no power to impose any decision on any territory. They make recommendations what is really and most worrying for me is if the people behind that report were actually to seize power in the UK, I think you would have a, a, a run for independence across a number of the territories. Because it is, a, it is a, a shameless and shameful attempt of, at introducing neocolonialism seeking to, to well, recommending that the UK government interfere and intervene in areas which have been long since, like immigration, uh, like, like the, the, the laws around our electoral process, which have long since been, been devolved to the territories, is simply a way of, of trying to control what transpires in, in the territories. Um, that is not the view of the current UK government. Of that I am certain, I am in regular, regular contact with. But it's certainly the view of those who wrote that report. But I will say, and I think most people know how very conservative I am, the day the UK government seriously considered, considers that persons who are not Caymanians can stand for office here is the day, if I'm still able and alive, I lead the charge for independence. Because that, that is a, a, akin to an attempt to take over uh, the territory and, and, and to decide and to impose their will on, on the direction that the country should take. As I say, and I hasten to say again, that is the Foreign Affairs Committee's report is not reflective of the current government approach to any of these issues, uh, not even the one, uh, the, the point with respect to beneficial ownership. As we know, as a result of our intervention and our negotiations, the UK has pushed the date for implementation of public registers back to 2023, by which they hope 
public record registers of beneficial ownership would be a global standard. The Cayman position remains the same, which is when it's a global standard, we're there. Until then, we are going to resist it with ever seen you. Now, you announced the creation of a new ministry, and obviously investment, in, internal uh, inward investment is one of the key platforms for that, and consolidating some of the different departments that reach out to bring in business to Cayman. Um, over the last five to 10 years, we've had other agencies come into Cayman from abroad and basically steal our business. They came in and certain industry sectors really almost fled with them because they did such a good job enticing some of those industries away from us. And as you know, the labor issue, it's very difficult for some of our employers to get the labor they need to expand their business. You saw the uh, state of business survey saying that some of our members are now reaching out to other jurisdictions and growing jobs in other jurisdictions. So I guess my, my question is, is it your intention to really ramp up this, this investment agency or whatever you, after you do the, the study, so that we become more aggressive in our approach to actually drive business to come here? Yes. The, what we identified, and, and the reason for the creation of, of, the, of the Ministry of International uh, um, Trade, Investment, Aviation, and, and Maritime Affairs, is an identification by us that our approach to this has been fragmented over the years. We've, we've had many attempts at, at this and various agencies doing it, but we need a coordinated approach to it. And that really can only be done effectively, I believe, if there is one ministry and one minister sort of driving the, the process. And that's where we're trying to get. But, but to your other point, I mean, one of the great challenges that Cayman faces is the pace at which we're growing. I mean, I'm a firm believer that the day we stop growing is the day we start dying. Um, and that the, the, a large reason, the principal reason for the success of Cayman is because we've been willing to do what many other the, of the other territories won't do, which is to be much more open and to, to investment, much more open to people coming here from, from elsewhere and, and living and working and, and setting up businesses. But there is there's such a thing as carrying capacity and, and how quickly we get from six to five or seven to whatever we are to 100 or 110,000 people is something that we all have to think very carefully about because the carrying capacity of, of the country um, is only so much. And you get to a point which I think we're already reaching um, with respect to some, some areas of tourism where the experience is not as good as we would like it to be simply because we don't have the infrastructure uh, in place to be able to cope. So that, uh, th that um, th the point about attracting more investment and, and more, more business and more people here has to be tempered by the reality of what is the carrying capacity of the place. Uh, I think I, um, Chris hit the nail on the head when he talked about things like housing and, and we all know what the challenges with the road systems and, and so forth. So, We've got to, to consider all of these things um, together and not simply focus on, well, we need more business, we need more business. We've got to make sure that we have the wherewithal to cope with it uh, and that we don't significantly alter um, adversely the life experiences of, of all of us who live and work here and call this place home. And the last question just deals with the airport. We're, we're going to be opening up a brand new airport and already, as you mentioned, there have been some cost overruns. And, but the reality is it, it's a brand new airport and um, it's much nicer than what we had and hopefully things are coming through. But there are still some issues already we're facing. I think some members, when they wrote to me, they're saying obviously first impressions of our visitors coming in. It's clearly important. And then during some Saturdays, we're still experiencing some three hours in wait times through immigration and customs on Saturdays. So the final question really is, is, is the airport's authority and others looking at maybe an electronic passport readers like they have in Aruba and other places to streamline that process to really allow our airport to, to, to really benefit from these massive improvements that you've put in place? Indeed, in, in fact, it, uh, towards the end of my speech, I referred to the pilot uh, project, which is, which is now starting to introduce the, the kiosks. Uh, and looking more at, um, at better ways, I mean, some of the things that we've recently introduced, like the green channel, where you, if, if you don't have anything to declare, you, right. you just go through that. So that the, the inspection process, which used to 
you know, really wear people down and keep people there um, for, for exceeding, exceeding long periods of time um, can be done away because it's now an intelligence-led approach to, to how, who we, t we target and what we inspect. Um, but I'm sure there's much more that, that we can do to speed, to speed the process up. Believe you me, particularly the Minister of, of Tourism and his team are, are keenly focused on, on the importance of that initial experience as you step off the plane and, and to smooth the, trans, the transfer of those who, who visit, as well as those of us who live here, right. um, you know, through and into your waiting vehicle and, and on to your destination. Yeah, well, I thought I was the last question, Premier, but I have to ask one more. And it deals with the cruise per port. And this is to deal with, it seems as though the port's going to go ahead, the berthing and hopefully uh, the berthing and everything. It seems like everything's being put in motion from all you've done over the last six years. Um, so you got three, three cruise lines now that are putting money forward that the country will no longer have to, will not have to pay any of the bill to pay, build the berths from what we understand. So the question now is once they begin construction, what impact do you think that's going to have on the businesses in town? And have you begun discussions with Colin Lumsden and other people to really kind of think about what impact it's really going to have on the business community while the berths are being constructed? Well, those discussions have been ongoing for some time and are still ongoing. And I think the, one, one of the really great things about having this level of commitment of the cruise companies through the, the construction process is they have a vested interest too in the least disruption as possible because they, the experience for their, for their um, cruise passenger is critically important to them. And so you can believe that whatever um, construction program is, is laid out is going to, to be um, heavily focused on, on making the experience uh, as as good as possible, mm -hmm. given the fact that you are constructing mm -hmm. uh, a pier there. I suppose the upside is that you know, we don't currently have a pier, <laughs> so the ships are anchored out anyhow. So it, it gives us a flexibility with, with respect to that uh, as to where, where um, cruise visitors actually disembark, mm -hmm. because there is not an existing pier that, that we're going to disrupt. Um, the activity that's been going on there, and then obviously for the first time building one, the cargo as as well as it's an important, obviously the lifeline to our country. So, so put your hands together to the premier and thank him for. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and enjoy the rest of the afternoon.